Hey everyone, my name is uh, Benjamin Montañez. I'm the chairman of the Consortium on Global Leadership at the Kennedy School. The uh, Consortium on Global Leadership, CGL, is the only organization at Harvard comprised of students from the Kennedy School, the Law School, and the Business School. Our crest is over here the, uh, on the wall. We've kind of uh, we've put them all together, though. Uh, this is largely uncharted territory, and we're grateful to the Center for Public Leadership for helping us out, and uh, they've really supported us, and they've really been willing to assist us in this endeavor. For more information on upcoming events or how to get involved, please sign up at our table that we have in the lobby. We also have uh, representatives from the three schools. We've got Carly Kelly and Chris Ray from Harvard Law School. Any law school folks, come and talk to them. They're bosses over there. We've also got uh, Gog <coughs> Boonswang from the Harvard Business School. And he's the guy you want to talk to over there. This is the consortium's kickoff event of the year, and we're delighted that Professor Bennis was gracious, to accept, gracious enough to accept our invitation. We know that he's much in demand, and so we truly appreciate this opportunity. Uh, after Professor Bennis concludes his remarks, we're going to open it up to a question and answer period. We've set up two microphones in the aisle. Uh, so in order to ask a question, please make your way to the mics so that the uh, audience members can hear and Professor Bennis can hear your question. Uh, when posing a question, please general rules, state your name, your school affiliation, and your year. Uh, Professor Bennis needs no introduction to Harvard or the MIT communities, but in case any members of our audience are new or have been under a rock, we, I'm going to give a brief introduction and then quickly get out of your way. Uh, Professor Bennis is a visiting scholar at the Center for Public Leadership. He currently serves as chair of the Center's advisory board and is a Thomas S. Murphy Distinguished fellow, Research Fellow at the Business School. He's visiting from the University of Southern California, where he is a distinguished professor of business administration, and he's the founding chairman of the USC Leadership Institute. In addition to Harvard University and USC, Professor Bennis has been on the faculties of MIT, Boston University, and numerous universities around the world. He's also served as provost of the State University of New York at Buffalo and president of the University of Cincinnati. Professor Bennis has found the time to write more than two dozen books including the best-selling Leaders and On Becoming a Leader, both translated into 21 languages. The Financial Times recently named Leaders as one of the top 50 business books of all time, and his book, An Invented Life, was nominated for a Pulitzer. Pulitzer. Uh, his most recent book, which I read last semester and highly recommend, <laughs> is Geeks and Geezers, How Era, Values, and Defining Moments Shape Leaders, co-authored with uh, Robert J. Thomas. Outside of academia, Professor Bennett is a consultant for more than for many Fortune 500 companies and has served on four U.S. presidential commissions. The title of today's talk is "The Most Common and Fatal fa Failures of Leadership." So, without further ado, Professor Warren Bennis. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so pleased that I'm so sorry that we don't have enough places to, to sit for you back there, but certainly uh, I'm just thrilled at the, I, you know, I'm, I'm so thrilled because not only are other invited guests here, but also my, I see a number of my students in my current class, my doctoral seminar, and excitingly, two of my former undergraduate students at the University of Southern California, my day job. By the way, is there anything going on later tonight? <laughs> so I, uh, you know, uh, I, <laughs> Whoa, okay. See, I, as, a, as a Yankee fan since I was five, uh, it's very hard, and I've been going to grief counseling this week to uh, <laughs> get used to it. I, I'm very glad, so glad to be here because there's anything that, you know, involves the bringing together, crossing boundaries of, of any department and discipline in school. It's not easy. And I want to congratulate the, the Consortium for Global Leadership for having the perseverance and the, um, and the, the drive to get this thing started. I think it's really, really important. We don't usually have that opportunities. And Benjamin, Thank you and your leadership and the others from the law school 
uh, and the business school for being this off. It's just, it's really <coughs> great. And I want to celebrate it and congratulate you for this opportunity. I had the pleasure last year of also kicking off the year, and I'm, you know, I'm, let's make this an annual event. It'd be great. <laughs> It'd be great. Um, yeah, le leadership, and I'm going to go through my re remarks very br briefly uh, uh, and try to get as much questions, ideas from you all, too. But, you know, we're dealing in the topic of leadership. It's always, it's regularly contested terrain. You know, there are just so many takes. I see before me colleagues who have written terrific books on leadership. We all have our point of view. That's what makes the field, the idea of leadership, so incredibly fascinating, inviting, and endlessly interesting. I mean, it is one of those things one can study all their lives um, and still feel there's so much you don't know. And that's not just false modesty. I've written a lot in the topic, but I still know that there are so many areas there that are still to be discovered. And that's, these days, I think, especially though, people are, we're, we're always interested in leadership, really. But in fact, these days, maybe especially so, the world situation, uh, the globalization, and of course, the looming and still to be un unfolding uh, corporate misbehaviors, malfeasances, crimes, felonies that are still being played out, which make those of us who are mainly concerned, as I've been, but not exclusively though, with corporate leadership, it makes one really have to question what we've been doing and to take a serious look at what we're doing. And usually, um, you know, and there you can also see the interest in, in leadership by the just tons of books. And, you know, I just Googled the topic of leadership and came up with about nine million items. You know, and they keep going. That was just, you know, last month. It's going to be more as we go on. And some of the books these days uh, on leadership really do interest me. Uh, Jesus, CEO, Michelangelo, CEO, Queen Elizabeth I, CEO, <laughs> the Tao of leadership. Um, but my, my recent favorite is the Mafia Manager. And uh, it, there are a lot of things I learned in this book. They end with four big deliverables, they call it. Uh, one, it pays to get information from the enemy. Two, punish one, teach a hundred. <laughs> Three, keep your, your friends close, but your enemies keep them closer. And uh, fourth, if you must lie, be brief. <laughs> Most of the work on leaders uh, has been in the, uh, it, they tend to be, including work of my own, they tend to actually take outstanding exemplary leaders and try to illustrate through their uh, narratives some ideas of exemplary leadership. Uh, Churchill once said that we're all worms. Some of us are glow worms. And most of the people that I've written about and some of the authors I see in my audience have written about tend to be exemplary. And I think, actually, there's a point that we think we learn more from outstanding individuals than we do from, in my, in my sense, than we do from run-of-the-mill average. Both extremes. Outstanding, you can learn a lot more, I think. And I've certainly, my emphasis has really been on outstanding, exemplary, uh, really, people whose leadership values and behaviors I tend to identify and even valorize. Well, tonight I'm going to turn my attention elsewhere. Tonight I'm going to talk about what are some of the common failings. Uh, and, I want to, um, and I want to address just a couple of them. But I'm not, mind you, going to be talking about the Ken Lays and the Bernie Ebers, those scoundrels and criminals and crooks who have run away with or cost the American public, cost us, just, in, just since uh, the latter part of 01, something in the neighborhood approaching, approaching four billion dollars. I'm not talking about the crooks tonight. I want to talk more about some of the things that we all, all leaders, every once in a while. Um, but some of them can be fatal. And, um, and as I thought about this talk tonight, it's interesting that all three of the failures, the, the most common failures I'm going to dwell on, um, are as aspects of knowing or seriously not knowing. All, you know, it was interesting. I had no idea that would be the, the framework. But it fit in, it, 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 my, my remarks really fit into that very simple framework. Things that we know and don't know. And the first will have to do with 
with uh, knowing others. If you want to put it in conceptual ways, knowing the social network. That's one. But knowing others. And the second is some a phrase that I've really actually borrowed and, and really have taken from some recent work going on with uh, Tony Mayo and Nitin Noria at, at the Harvard Business School, which I want them to call their work, I want them to title their book, they're not decided on that yet, Contextual Intelligence. It's an area that's really not been dealt with very much. And I think their book may make a, a landmark contribution. And I like the term contextual intelligence. That means, how do you read the ecology? Or how, how you don't read the ecology? And thirdly, I want to talk about the other blind spot, perhaps the, the most vulnerable one with all of us, the self, the individual. Which we're, so it's really social network or the others. The second is having to do with the contextual intelligence, not knowing what's going on. And third, and perhaps maybe the deepest one, has to do with, um, with the self. So first let me start off on the, um, the broadest, and I think this one is really often fatal. I call it the Caesar problem, because, you know, Shakespeare knew it all, but you know, it's discouraging to read Shakespeare. I'm not talking about the, I mean his plays. Uh, that genius is, it's almost hard to believe what he could put into a play. And he used plays as allegories to illustrate what was going on in contemporary England at the time. That's what makes it even doubly interesting, to get his, as his perspective of why he was writing. But I call the Caesar problem um, arrogance, not listening. In, when I was in uh, Abu Dhabi a couple of years ago, a colleague there, uh, someone I met in Abu Dhabi, told me about a Middle Eastern uh, phrase which I love. He called it tired ears people who've stopped listening. When you think about leaders like Margaret Thatcher, who had a brilliant first nine years, and then the last period of her time, she was forced out by her own party. She stopped listening. You think about Eckhart Pfeiffer, compact, eight and a half terrific, uninterrupted years of growth. But he had an A-list and a B-list. And his A-list said, yes, sir, yes, sir. Everything, you know, one of those, aye, aye, sir. And the B-list was saying, hey, 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 boss, you know, Maybe we better look at what Gateway is doing. Maybe we ought to look at what Dell is doing, because they really are taking away a lot of our... He didn't want to listen or look at, or even he stopped seeing the people in the B-list who were giving him disconfirming bad news. And he had tired ears. Well, I can think of many, many other examples, and I'm going to make, make, mention some more later. Let's look at Caesar now. This is, this is interesting. Caesar, who knew his way around, enormously powerful. Probably, the, when you think about world history, It'd be hard to imagine someone who had a wider span of influence than Julius Caesar. And, and for the most part, we're thinking about uh, relying on the plane now. A military genius, first, an absolutely first class mind. Uh, the first, by the way, uh, even uh, thinking about what's recently happened in my home state of California. <laughs> <laughs> he was the first celebrity leader. I mean, this man knew how to wear a toga. I'm not joking. Uh, you know, I'm really not joking. I mean, he really did know he was you know, on camera. And, um, and then it was said by, by uh, Cato that when Cicero spoke, people marveled. When Caesar spoke, people marched. Now, that's interesting. That's what you call leadership. Not just marveling at your brilliant words, but, but marching at, at the words. Now, Okay, come on. How could he not have known what was going on in 44 BC when those conspirators stabbed him, you know, in the front? That's what you can watch and they call, you know, they call that a friend. An enemy of some stabs you, stabs you in the back. In Washington, they say, a friend stabs you in the front. But anyway, those are his buddies. Brutus, Cassius, Casca, you know, all these guys. They were plotting for some time. And more than that, he had uh, Calpurnia, his Devoted wife had this dream, which was horrible, about his being about a statue of Caesar with blood running down, a hundred spouts, and lusty Romans washing their elbows and hands in his blood. An, an owl hooted. May not mean much to you, but it meant a lot in 44 BC Rome. A, a lion, a lion ran through the streets. What's going on? And Arthur Medoras, he, he was welcome to the forum against all better advice, and Arthur Medoras said, 
had a note in a scroll which he kept trying to hand to Caesar as Caesar was walking to the forum. And in it said, beware of Cassius, beware of Casca, beware of Brutus most of all. But he didn't look at this, you know, he didn't pay attention. Now that's, why, why is it that he didn't pay attention? What's going on? What didn't he want to know? This is the question I really think about today in, in current politics. What, did, what didn't he want to know and when didn't he want to know it? So fast forward to June 5 this year. And the man who has the most vaulted position in all of world journalism, the executive editor of the New York Times, was fired. Austin, with his uh, co-leader, his number two, Gerald Boyd. And why were they fired? Well, presumably on the surface it's because Jason Blair, the Jason Blair case, can remember the Jason Blair case? This young, uh, wayward, gifted uh, African-American reporter who everybody knew who worked with him, and he was plagiarizing. And not only plagiarizing, but sending in stories that were based on fiction. And uh, it caused a real kerfuffle, at the, uh, to say the least, at the New York Times. Now, what's interesting is, when things got rocky for Mr. Raines, he started to talk to the people, of, of, this is a month before he was ousted, and he found, tried to find out what they think of him. Now, this is what's interesting. A year before Mr. Raines was ousted, there was a 17,000 word article in the New Yorker about him written by Ken Oletta. Let me read you the first paragraph of this letter <clears throat> about a profile of Mr. Howell Range. It was called, incidentally, the Howell Doctrine. Now, the Howell Doctrine was kind of a pun on the Powell Doctrine. You take no prisoners, you, you only send in forces that come in. Here's the paragraph about Mr. Raines. A man who takes the subway wearing the white Panama hat of a plantation owner is either blithely arrogant and imperious or irrepressibly self-confident. And in the nine months that Reigns has been the executive editor of the New York Times, both qualities have been attributed to him. And what struck me, the, the month or so before Reigns was fired, brought the whole staff together in a room, well, it was actually in a darkened theater in New York. It was dark and it was closed and he brought the whole staff together. And he said how stunned he was to hear this is nine months after the article came out. That people thought he was arrogant, played favorites. You know, he seemed shocked, deeply shocked. And uh, I, was, I was amazed. Uh, how could he not know? Yeah, how many, could you imagine, for example, when that article about uh, President Summers came out in the New York Times Magazine section a month or six weeks ago, I forget when, can you imagine President Summers and his entire staff, and probably every member of the faculty, not reading that piece? So I know that Mr. Raines could not have been shot. Clearly he knew. Clearly he read that 17,000 word article. What's going on here? Why don't people listen? Why don't, by the way, it's not, that, that's the Shakespearean. That's, in a way, Raines, what's so Shakespearean about it, here is a gifted, talented, at the peak of his career, this is a man who is a newspaper man, who is a brilliant, won seven Pulitzers that one year he was in office. Six of them dealing with a 9-11, and one other for one of the other sections. How do you account for this? The, the, the tragedy is how we lose good people, because they cannot listen or don't want to listen. Something's going on, I don't understand, but I don't want to make it just Shakespearean, because you know, um, I think it happens to all of us at different times. That's why it's common, and it can be fatal. And I want to read you a section of a paper that was um, turned in a, a couple of weeks ago, October 8th, as a matter of fact, by a student in my class who was a distinguished student. He's a, he just served in Iraq, lieutenant colonel, now at the Kennedy School, mid-career course. Uh, his name is Mike Denning, and I see him in the corner of my eye over there. <laughs> And I asked him if I could read this little section. Here's a talented guy who led a force of squadron of helicopters in Iraq. And has just returned this year to join us. Um, and he writes about this, how he's trained the group. And this is a, uh, 
a guy with lots of savvy to begin with. Anyone who goes through the Marines, by the way, is a Marine Lieutenant Colonel, knows about leadership, let me tell you. I think the military academies really do as good a job, maybe a better job, than, than I think almost any institution. So he wrote his paper uh, on, this was his paper on difficulties, we call them crucibles in the class. So he said, and he's talking about his, the squadron, he's about ready to send into combat in a helicopter. He said, for the next hour, I listened attentively as they informed me I was failing in their eyes. His squadron leaders, officers, telling him that he was failing in their eyes. Specifically, they cited my failure to foster trust in the squadron. Anyone who knows Mike would be puzzled about that. Foster trust in the squadron. I'd sat there in a state of bewilderment and utter confusion. I distinctly remember feeling like I just took a body shot from Mike, from Mike Tyson, unable to breathe. And he goes on, the pangs I felt were from a failure, his quote, his underline, this is all his emphasis, my failure to recognize the dissatisfaction among my officers. My hubris in the squadron's achievements blinded me to the frustration felt by those closest to me. Think Brutus, think Cassius, think Cassius. Closest to Caesar they were. How did I get to the point that I couldn't recognize now what was so easy to spot in my father 30 years ago? <coughs> I thought about the irony of my officers returning home disenchanted and the lessons their children must be learning. Well, it, it, goes, it refers to something else about his dad. It, it's one hell of an essay. Um, and I'm uh, so glad that Mike gave me this morning permission. I read it because it's a commonplace. I mean, it's fun, but it can be fatal. In Rain's case, it's, it's been fatal. I mean, in other cases, top leadership. So that's one. That's got to do with somehow not somehow losing, co losing connection, losing your, not noticing. Yeah, that, I always think about passion as the intensity of attention. It's when you lose, when you, when you stop paying attention, somehow or another. And there are a lot of good reasons for it. And there are a lot of lousy reasons for it. So that's one. We'll talk to the next two, which have to do with, um, with, with myself. And I thought I might as well come clean about, and talk more, a little bit about my own I don't want to call them failures because, by and large, I don't think Mike, Mike Denning was a failure because he learned so damn much from it. I think the people who don't learn from these crucibles, from these stress situations, from times when they had made errors, missteps, false starts, whatever, there's no failure if you can learn as much as I know Mike did and as much as I hope I did. And I want to tell you two events. One has to do with uh, this notion of contextual intelligence. Um, this was during my seven years at, uh, at the University of Cincinnati. I'm very proud of those years, looking back. Through the shining ether of time, I think I did a hell of a job. <laughs> <laughs> but I didn't feel all that way when I left, serving those seven years. And uh, I remember Clark Kerr's statement. Uh, when Clark Kerr was a, was a famous president of the University of California, and he was ousted by then governor of California, Reagan, who thought that the campus was going to muck and he's got to get rid of that guy. It was, it was, it was really when the, the, it was actually where the, the first beginnings of the student riots of the late 60s at Berkeley. This was actually 64. And when he left, when he gave his last press conference, Clark Kerr, uh, he said, I'm leaving the University of California exactly as I came, fired with enthusiasm. <laughs> and that's sort of um, <laughs> the way I felt. <laughs> now, the problem, let me get, this is interesting, because this is another common error. Yeah, and I have to refer to something that Falstaff told Prince, Prince Hal, who later became a remarkable king, Henry V. And he said, Falstaff, who was this avuncular drunk that was a lovable character, the most lovable, interesting character maybe, aside from Hamlet and Shakespeare, he said, his advice to Prince Hal, he was worried about Prince Hal, as he put it, skipping king. He was worried he would skip being king. That's interesting. He wasn't sort of kingly. He grew into it. So he said to he, what he said to, to Hal was, "If you want to lead, you need you better you need to enter their world. Their world. What's their world? Their world is the context. That's the world you as leaders are entering. Worlds that are new, unfamiliar often. 
I entered Cincinnati, which is, if you don't know Cincinnati, anybody here from Cincinnati? Any Reds fans? Okay, never mind. Um, it's a conservative city. I was sort of brought in to rattle the cages to get that very proud city supported, only one, only two remaining, Cooney and New York, and so to make it into a state university. It took three years to do. The people of Cincinnati thought I was stealing their university away from them. In fact, they were, the city was only paying 6%. Tuition kept going up. And this is a blue collar school. So here was I, a kind of a foreigner, and I was told by one of the great wise men in Cincinnati who started the, what later became Federated Department Stores. His name was Fred Lazarus Jr. He was 85. And though he had Parkinson's, he took a shine to me and tried to give me advice. He said, Warren, this is a real conservative city. Don't be too visible. Take it, work with it, your faculty, work with your students. Do not get overly involved. Do not get sucked in, you know, into being visible. Take it easy. Here I was, a guy from the East, given the charge by the board to shake things up, but I didn't really try to understand that culture. Mark Twain, when he visited Cincinnati, wrote a column a couple of months later, said, if the world ever comes to an end, uh, you should be in Cincinnati, because it will happen there 10 years later. <laughs> it's a real important city. So there I was, uh, at the age of 45, dashing from, you know, the, the MITs and the, all that, that, or that shimmer of the East, which is despised, I'll tell you, in Hamilton County which has voted only once for a Democratic president since the Civil War, and that was 64 of Lyndon Johnson. So the first thing, during the first month there, I, I you do get some press coverage, and being new to this, I, I kind of enjoyed it. You know, the Cincinnati Magazine did an article on my family and me, looking, you know, it was like Camelot to a few people. <laughs> uh, to the town's father, it was a pain in the neck at least, and anyway, so also I agreed I was talked into by a TV station in town to do a show on Cincinnati, which I would host. I thought that was a good idea. You know, Cincinnati could use some visibility, and I could talk each week, interview some of the great students and faculty, right? He said, hey, yeah, that's okay. I sort of like that. And they decided to call the show, <coughs> get this, Bennett's exclamation point. <laughs> Uh, I'm not asking you to judge me too harshly on that. <laughs> but it shows you how you can get sucked in as a new leader. You know, we kind of, this is brand new. And you know, it's so seductive to uh, end it. But you know, I did object. I wanted, the truth is, I, I had a little, you know, it was the exclamation point. <laughs> so here's the deal. Here's the lesson from it about context. I didn't understand, I didn't take the time to understand the city. It's pride, it's history. There was a great station for free slaves moving to the north. Harriet Beecher Stowe grew up there, wrote her book, Uncle Tom's Cabin there. Her dad was a famous preacher in town. Has an enormously interesting history. I didn't take the time to honor it. Now think about leaders today who come in as change agents. Think of Carly Farina for a moment, HP, chairman and CEO. Three strikes against to begin with. A woman, not an engineer, and the first non Hewlett Packard person ever to be elevated to the top role. What does she do to navigate that between the past and the present? And <coughs> Alfred North Whitehead, who in a speech back in the 20s to the, at the Harvard Business School said the following. He said, a successful leader must be careful if they're interested in change to adhere simultaneously to the symbols of tradition and stability and the, tr the symbols of change and innovation. How do you do that without, and I think Carly is a good example because her first time report was using Dave Packard's and Bill Hewitt's, the idea of the boys in the garage, but also at the bottom of it said invent. So she was trying, she ran into trouble, you remember, with Walter Hewlett Jr. But, and she handled that by, spending an enormous amount of time talking to stakeholders. We hope she succeeds. But that navigation, to adhere to the symbols of the past and, and honor and celebrate them and yet move to the that's if you're a change agent, that's real tough to do. If you're taking over an institution which is 
let's just keep the status let's the status quo that's not a problem but no organization these days can succeed going forward with the status quo um, so that's the second that's what I call contextual intelligence lastly I want to talk about the self and again I'm going to refer to um, my own experience at, at Cincinnati and this is a big one for me and I've actually did write this up it has to do with drive and ambition and aspiration I really really wanted to be a university president for a lot of reasons some having to do with ambition some having to do with wanting to see whether my ideas really had validity on the ground so to speak and I just had that desire. My role also, I, my main mentor was a university, he was a college president, and I wanted to follow very much. He, he was really very influential in my life in all sorts of ways. Um, and uh, some of you I know, know him and too, a great man, Doug, Douglas McGregor. Um, I wanted to be one so bad that I left my MIT job where I had what every professor kind of dreams of, a corner office tenure at a great institution. And I took a job as provost at SUNY Buffalo. Now, for those of you in academic life here, and most of you are, that's kind of a, what, I don't know. That's uh, well, yeah, I don't know. I won't leave that for you. But, <laughs> I don't want to get into that. But, but um, anyway, when I was at MIT, they didn't, when I called someone, they didn't put me on hold. At Buffalo, they did often. So I mean, it says something about institutions, you know, and their charisma. So I want, you know, I also I'd seen a play that that year. Uh, it was a chorus line. Of course, I had a line in it: <clears throat> "To commit suicide in Buffalo is redundant." <laughs> and so here I go, and, and I remember, you know, why I brought open. I wanted to be because this I thought was a platform to to a presidency. Well, I did become a president in Cincinnati, four years at Buffalo. Rough years, actually. I learned enormous amount. So um, I did that for about seven years, but my penultimate year, my next to last year, I was giving a talk not very far from here. It was at the education school at Long, by the way, so coincidental. This is this the Longfellow room? Yes. I think it's a Longfellow oh. at the Bill Hall, and that's why I was giving a talk. It was a, a small, like, law school room and there were mainly uh, graduate students, faculty, and in the back of the room, sitting in the very last row, was a man I truly, uh, uh, was another, uh, not a real mentor, but a guy I just admired enormously. His name was Paul Ilvesacker, and some of you may know of him or, or knew him. Great, great man, very so wise. So I gave a talk there, and the talk was on the role of the university president, the leadership of the university president and to talk about it. So that's what I, I worked very hard on the talk. And I thought the talk went really well. You, know, you really feel on top of the game. And, you know, and you felt the audience is with you and you felt the energy from the audience. And then I took Q&A. <clears throat> and then the ants, then Paul, sitting in the back, floats a question to me. You can kind of like see, see the seams of the question. It was <laughs> like a real, like almost a, you know, a knuckleball that just sort of <laughs> over the heads of the people. And and the question was, uh, Warren, do you love being president of the University of Cincinnati? Do you love being president? I was totally, totally stumped. I don't, um, I, 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 so there were people there who remember that evening who later have talked to me about it, but I don't think I could answer it. I know I, I could hear my heart beat. It seemed like a minute, it was probably maybe three, five, who knows? But I, I finally was able to look up at him and say, Paul, I don't know. So when I went back on the plane the next morning to Cincinnati, I knew. What it was that Paul Ivesak was picking up in my eyes, I've speculated about because Paul, I didn't see him afterwards. And uh, he died, I think, really, really young of diabetes. And so I never had a chance to talk to Paul. And, but I know, I know, I know, I feel I'm right. What I think he saw in me was a detached, um, intellectualizer, uh, like a social anthropologist, and he wanted looking at the scene and reporting it. And if, maybe if you were an anthropologist, you would have thought, that's good speech, you know, as an anthropologist. But as a participant, as an actor, as a player, what did he pick up? 
something like too detached? Is his heart in it? His heart in it? Is his passion there? And then I realized later that that's not my calling. What a, what a lesson that is. But what I'm getting at here is the, is the, is the self-knowing. Because I really, really, and by the way, no regrets. It isn't like I'm, this is not a whine. I'm so thankful that I had that experience. Because it really led me on to do better work than what I can do best, what I think I can do best, which is to teach and to write and to study and to, not that I'm totally removed from practice. I have such enormous regard for the practitioner. But that's what's informed my work. So I can't, a failure, not, I don't, not at all. Um, but just that sense of, of knowing. And you know, it takes a while. I was not a kid when Paul Ildesacker in 1978 asked that question. I was not a kid. I was, must have been 52. You know, it takes a while to figure out what your calling is. And so I realized that passion is what is part, what is a lot, it's a lot about passion. And I was thinking about that a lot, about what is true, how do you know that 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 role you play, that job you have, is, is really gives you meaning, keeps you keeps you remembering why you're living, doing something that you think makes a difference. And I, I kept thinking about that marvelous quote from Jerry Garcia, who said, and he said something that st always stays with me. He said, "You do not merely, you do not merely want to be considered just the best of the best." You want to be considered the only ones who do what you do. Okay, uh, that's it. I, I, I thank you very much. Thank you. Okay. All right. Um, I'd be eager to. Well, I hope that something kicked off a question that may have had nothing to do with anything I said, but has interested you about leadership or what, any remarks I made, or remarks that you want to make. <coughs> Hi, Johan. Yes. Johan is in my current seminar. Yeah. Um, my question is uh, what's implied in your second point about context, and you also wrote about it in your forthcoming HBR article, is that... Uh, <laughs> hey! <laughs> so I got you. <laughs> January. <laughs> ah, it's, yeah, okay. Was that a leader should, uh, in, the f in the first um, period of his leadership, he should... Uh, take things slowly and yes. learn the environment and so on. Yes. But it's so often told about leaders that the first hundred days are your real yeah. opportunity for yeah. change and so on. So yeah, how yeah. do you reconcile the two? Uh, excellent question. Thanks, Rohan. Is that it? One more? Or is that? I can elaborate, but I'll let you do the job. <laughs> OK. I'll elaborate. <laughs> uh, no, 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 no I, I, say, I, say some more. Generally, it's said, you know, about prime ministers yeah, and generally yeah. about new leaders and organizations that the first hundred days is where you can really determine the angle. Yeah. And if you don't initiate any change, then it will be very difficult later on. And mm -hmm. it's somewhat uh, contradictory to your mm -hmm. observation that mm -hmm. it's really, if you initiate any change, you can alienate people and you'll ultimately fail. So yeah, I really appreciate your question. That comes from a guy who served in the Israeli military, in the special troops. So it's a tough one. And uh, it's really often, a, it's, a, it's really, I'm not trying to comment on it, Johan, but it's, a, it's really paradoxical because there may be certain changes that people are feeling such angst and let's get to that, let's start, let's do something about unemployment because it was, it was Roosevelt who made the first 100 days uh, a kind of a mantra. And there's a certain truth to, you know, people talk about the fact that your power wanes after the first, you know, staying on too long and certainly, so the first 100 days are critical. At the same time, they, and there are certain things that just need to be done. And the former guy couldn't fire 35,000 GM employees like Mr. Stemple who's feeling too loyal. So that was so obvious how to be done, and people were <laughs> relieved when that happened. But and supposedly things, you have more credit initially. Yeah, yeah, also, and also because of a lot of other reasons that would be too sensitive. One doesn't want to move on things that look precipitous, that look not bold, but look reckless. And so there's, it's, it's sort of, it's navigating both of those. I'm glad you brought that up, 
and, and, and caught me on that first 100 days can be. But there the judgment comes in, the judgment calls to me. Which am I going to start to shake up first? Like, like um, the president of my university now, uh, who I have enormous respect for, uh, not primarily because I chaired <coughs> the search committee that brought him there, but uh, because I do respect the guy. And he was a fraternity man when he came there. But the fraternities were really in trouble. And it was such a relief when Steve Sample did, made a few edicts about you know, doing something, but not banishing them, don't, don't get me wrong, but dealing with the fraternities. But he could get away with it because he had the idiosyncratic credits, right? That is, he was a, you know, he was a Greek, right? So he could do that. But one has to be very careful in what you choose. It was those first acts which often determine the way you're going to be perceived for the rest of your tenure. And that, that's one of the things I put in the article. Thanks, John. This is what I meant about the interest of, of leadership, because for every assertion, you can, you can hear the paradoxical <laughs> counter-assertion. Yeah. Hi, my name is Steven Yanez, and I'm a second year at the Kennedy School. I was wondering if you can address the whole idea of political leadership and failures in elected leadership, um, because you mentioned the, the whole aspect of listening and the connection with the people. Uh, there's a, I guess, a sort of a rare situation that an elected leader is in because he or she is entrusted to be in that position, but at the same time they have to reflect the popular will. So how, how do you foresee maybe a, um, a failure in, in, in elected leadership compared to other positions? Yeah, well, if you would talk to uh, former Vice President Al Gore, he would say that he listened to the wrong people, namely his consultants and pollsters, and he didn't go out and figure out what was, it's a tough question. How do you know? For example, as university president, so I'll talk to the president of the Senate, student Senate. I'll talk to the faculty Senate leader, right? I will talk to the board chairman. I will talk to all that incredibly, immensely complicated cartography of stakeholders out there. I'll talk to all the leaders. Do they represent their constituencies? Are they the people I should be talking to? I think the best leaders find out the way Henry V found out taking Falstaff's advice. He took off his royal robes put on the enlisted man's uh, army clothes, and he went and huddled with the troops and asked them what was going on. Clark Clifford, when he took over the Defense Department from McNamara, it was really difficult times, Vietnam War, he actually began talking to people at every level of the organization, not just the direct reports, not just getting the usual news. I think it's a rough job in a, in a constituency, especially if you've been in, had the same office for like eight years. Let's say you've been a congressman for eight or nine years. I don't know if Mickey Edwards is here, but he was like, I don't know, 13, 15 terms. Th th then, you, then the real challenge is how to keep listening to the new voices, the new demographies, and all that. And I just think it takes, let's see, who do we talk, yeah, there was a visitor to our class yesterday who said how he, he, he's in the uh, fashion business, so to speak, the fashion business. And what he, do you remember, what he talked about, I look at the 10 top TV things, the 10 top movies, but it's the 10 top books. You were there, I mean, he, he gets involved with pop culture by doing a whole list of things. I just think it takes endless, tireless, exhausting. If you want to be in political office, damn it, uh, it is an obligation to listen to the people and to make up your mind, not that you do a survey and do it, you know, you don't go like that. That's not what I'm talking about. But you've really got to know those deviant voices, those voices. And you've also got to trust, you've got to know who to tr whom to trust. That's another judgment thing. So it's, it's a real tough, tough one. And uh, the problem is that, how do you know? And I would think the first thing a new leader should do is to really ask that question. How do I really find out what, the, on a set of questions, what, what the, where the people are? And I, I don't think it's, I don't want to make it sound too exhausting and hard, but it is, it is what's going to keep you fresh. For, for, how does, yeah, to keep, to keep fresh in the job, too, and keep listening. And, but it takes a, a thing called curiosity and wonder and being a little bit edgy about the next election. Thank you. Hello, my name is Naoki Fuji. I come from Japan. Now I'm in the Kennedy School, a mid-care student. Uh, I took the leadership course last year and used your book, so it's very one of me Leaders, to yes. listen to yeah. your story directly. Uh, it's my uh, very uh, personal uh, question. Uh, I work for the government of Japan, and uh, as you know, there are a big movement in Japan 
of the, the reforms even in the government and the private sectors. And uh, in the government sectors, uh, many ministries uh, merged into the large the ministries. The total number is 22 to 13 in 2001. And there are big problems about the leadership in the new big ministries. So, as you know, the bureaucrats have a very powerful in Japan. The peer but, pressure, uh, right. Yeah, but so uh, now the no person can so exercise the real leadership in the big ministry. So it's a very mal malfunctional, I think. So uh, my question is, is there any some general suggestion about the merging of such kind of the organization and so exercising some kind of the good leadership in that kind of new situation? That is my I don't quite get it. Just put it in one sentence for me. Is there, what's the bottom line question? Could you do it again? Is it? Uh, my, my question is, uh, how is there any suggestion about uh, the how uh, can we make uh, build up the good leadership in kind of the merger or the, the restructuring of the organizations? Yeah. There are some so the very established organizations and so they are merged into big ones. And sure. in, in that situation, so nobody can make a good leadership. I think so. It's the kind of situation that will happen in the private because sector. Because there are so many people that the Mr. Koizumi has to uh, attend to and the Congress has to attend to that there couldn't be the kind of leadership that would get the country moving economically speaking, for one thing. Is yeah, that, my that concern is about yeah. this, uh, yeah. uh, some kind of, so in, in this country, in the department of, the, for example, the department of transportation, department of housing, uh -huh. we merged into such kind of big de department. And, yeah. and how can we establish the leadership yeah. in such kind of situation? Yeah. You know, um, I, was, I just came back from Japan, which is why I, I was trying, you know, interested in your question. And I wish I had, I wish I had a good answer. And it's, it's so, um, people when I was there kept asking me about Mr. Prime Minister Koizumi. And of course, as an outsider, you would be very careful, right? But I don't think I know enough to respond to that. But I would say this about the structure. That, I, that what I understand about the structure. Mm -hmm. so take this as a as a, a person not familiar with Japanese governance. I think right now the vested interests that control the Congress and on which the taxation system is based is so ingrained that it would make it difficult to get out of the gridlock of those special interests which have such a hold, and one party, the Liberal Democrat, has that hold. So unless there are some structural changes there, yeah. I think would be, I don't want to sound too gloomy or knowledgeable, because I'm not, but that would be the, where it has to happen, there. And also the people have to become far more active with their voices. Because I am saying to you what the editorials are saying, what the people are saying, and it doesn't change. Mm -hmm. And because I think the, vo the voices have to be loud and eloquent and clear and to create some changes about the how money is just how tax money which is big is distributed and until that changes mr koizimi with all his with his great haircut and charisma will not do it thank you very much god did you oh hello my name is claire healy i'm a second year mpa student at the school and um, firstly thank you for sharing with us your life's lessons, or some of them. Um, I'm all for learning from mistakes and failures, preferably somebody else's, but, <laughs> but I'd love to know, um, knowing, I mean, if you were graduating now from the Kennedy School, for example, knowing then what you know now, what would you do with your life? <laughs> yes. These are easy. Okay, I got it. Yeah, I got it. Yeah, I was reminded of the time hour. My friend. Okay. Uh, okay. Um, yes. Um, you know, when I review, I'm not sure I'm going to have good advice for you. I'm sorry, but because I look backwards at my own career, it looks like a whole set of eccentric, eccentric precursors. There was no way I, at the time that I, when I was, I felt that I was drawn toward lots of different things. I want to give, for me only, I took as many chances as I could. Uh, I think of a colleague I have who I respect enormously and who has a parallel career to mine. He and I were both 
same institution. He stayed in this area, he continued at the institution. He's been a distinguished, a terrific scholar and teacher. And I did a lot of uh, things like I left the city. He couldn't understand why I gave up my position at MIT and to do crazy things like going to Buffalo. And I did a lot of other things in my life that this guy has had a much more stable life, a much more predictable life, and in some ways maybe, a, I'm not sure, happier, but he certainly I had a great principled envy of his life. For me, I just took every, every, I just needed to get out there. I needed to just try everything, live like hell, and for me, and learn from it. But that work, that was, I couldn't have done it differently. I could not be the guy I just described, although I have enormous, enormous respect for the guy and have some envy for his, his great life. But for me, I struck hard, did everything, uh, did a lot of foolish things, uh, both personally and professionally. But I felt I was, always had this passion for the promises of life. And of course, at times I got into trouble seeking that. But I don't know if I have any, I just think, Partly, you, you made, the thing I puzzled about, I know what it feels like to be passionate. I know what, I know what it feels like to love what I'm doing. I, I, it's, you know, to feel alive, to feel you're operating at John, my best self, okay? And, and that's great, I know what it feels like. I can give you the indicators of it, but I, can, I always feel at a loss when someone says, how do I get meaning? You have to figure that out. You have to figure out what, and I don't think you can plan everything in this world. Don't. That would be the one, if I had a piece of advice, is, is a, a strike hard, try everything. And I think you'll find the path, but it's going to be whatever fu fuels you. Uh, and boy, I wish I knew the answer to that. <laughs> God? Hi, Professor Bennis. Uh, from your book and uh, from some of our discussions in class, I've learned that true, re true leaders emerge during times of strife and pressure and urgency. Mm -hmm. And given that, I wanted to know, do you agree with the statement and the criticism that there's a lack of leadership today? Because given the current situation, the, f the fiscal situation in our world and uh, the global situation, there's mm -hmm. definitely a time of strife. And uh, it seems to me that there's a little bit of a lack of leadership. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, do you agree with that and, and yeah. why? I think the, the, ex the existential feeling, dog is that there is a, a question of leadership right now. We're seeing a lot of, not just in the corporate sector, but also in the political sector. And in Tuesday's New York Times, for example, there was a story which went uh, that the Democratic and Republican leadership is having a hard time wooing and recruiting reasonable people to run for the House. Partly because there are only about 15 contested seats. Partly because they don't want to go through the crap, the fundraising, you know, the, all that stuff that you have to do. And, so, and yet when we need the best women and men ever, we're not getting the best women and men going forward. And so I do think to that extent I agree with your, your concern. Um, I also think the problems are more complex. The contextual intelligence I mentioned earlier is, is a really, let's talk not about political leadership so much as like say business leadership or not-for-profit leadership. I think those inflection points, those, those, all, all those things happening, so, I think it's partly hard because we too much maybe buy into the myth that it has to be a Rushmorian figure, some object of enchantment who will, and I think what, well, I wish we had more of an opportunity to know what fun it could be, how great it could be to really be in a hot group doing things together. So I'd hate to, I mean, leadership is so exciting and so terrific and you could, where else can you make a difference? So it, it bothers me, I'm disconsolate and melancholy about people not wanting to step forward and take a, what, what better thing can you do in life but, but improve, to use an old fashioned phrase, human betterment. And that's what leadership is about. And yeah, I do think we, we there's never enough terrific leaders and uh, at this time I think we feel it very, very poignantly. And, and this is a, precisely the time when we need it most. I, I think I'll just take a couple more questions. Uh, what, is that, is that <coughs> okay, thanks God. Good evening, uh, Professor Bennis. My name is Mike Farrell. I'm a mid-career student at the uh, Kennedy School. And uh, I was intrigued by your um, uh, comments about Caesar, about uh, mm. especially what didn't he know and uh, when didn't he know it? When did he want to know it? 
Um, I was thinking about our current administration as well. When yeah, I there. but <laughs> in, 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 in combination with, with you know, uh, the comment about tired ears and, and stop paying attention. Now, I, uh, I've been a municipal manager for 12 years. And what, what city have you been? Uh, up in New Hampshire, a uh, couple different cities, but the uh, last stop was Hooksett, New Hampshire, for about six years. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always seemed to be the last to know. <laughs> that, you know I had a great assistant <laughs> who, who would, you know, watch my back and fill me in, but when she would tell me things, it would surprise the hell out of me. I had an open door policy literally yeah. and figuratively and I, I practiced management by walking around I got out talked to the guys you know in the fire department and talked mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the highway department but I was I was always the last to know and and it was like I, I wasn't paying attention somehow I uh, think, uh, think that was it I, 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 I mean you think it just I, weren't you just hearing but not listening do you think it was that or what i don't even well, know how did that you know you didn't know i mean what <clears throat> happened did something just something appear on your desk my god that no was, how did you know you didn't know that's what i want to get at because uh, my assistant would come up and oh, tell me uh hey you know this you know this counselor is uh gonna try to fire you tonight and uh <laughs> oh. <laughs> i said oh <laughs> trivial things like that yeah jesus talk about caesar god <laughs> I, and uh, you know, I thought I was doing all the right things, uh, but uh, well, these things thought? kept yeah. sneaking up on me. Okay, okay. Look, how would you answer your question? I mean, I'm really serious about that because I don't think it's a mechanical. You know, I don't want to get. I can't give you a mechanical response. Why do you think you were the last to know? Um, because I was, I was too busy doing other things yeah too busy doing other less important things right too busy into the speed dealing crowd. with the minutia too busy into the minutia yeah y y oh man uh, do i identify with that because uh, among other things i think there is an unconscious conspiracy about leaders and i want i think it's maybe important for you that i've i really got sucked in totally with this and i, and I actually call it the unconscious conspiracy when i came to cincinnati i had a lot of big change agenda people kept putting their wet babies on my desk I had open hours, just like you, open hours, you know, why? I thought I was a great listener, right? And what happened to me, because I wanted to be, you know, the savior, fixing those problems, I kept all my time diapering their babies. What I should have, and I think I colluded with that. And I wonder if we don't easily get into that trap. I don't know. And I just, also, if I were to give you a flip, glib answer, that one who uh, whispers in your ear about the girl, like voting against you tonight, you better get more of them around you to talk with. And people that they talk with. Mm -hmm. She got it from somewhere. So I don't know. But I do think there's a speed trap that we get so much into the routine of it, we get into the scheduling of it, and we really lose sight of what's important. That's what, I mean, that's where I think it is. And I was totally seduced by people, and, and by the way, what I call it a conspiracy, is they wanted to avoid change. That's what they were doing to me. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, well, thank you very much. That's going to be about uh, John Patrick. Yeah, so sure. One more? One more? Yeah. Okay. Uh, since I have the last question, uh, my name is Christine Dillon, and I'm a mid-career at the Kennedy School. And uh, one thing I noticed that we didn't or you didn't speak about this evening was um, some of the headlines in the paper, like uh, Mr. Grasso at the former, at formerly mm -hmm. at the New York Stock Exchange. We didn't talk really about compensation mm -hmm. and how do you mm -hmm. put a price tag uh, on effective or ineffective leadership, particularly in the corporate arena. Yeah. And how do you tie, how do you tie compensation? Yeah. Into that. Christine, were you here when I started? Uh, I was. Okay. Remember I said I'm not going to talk about those scoundrels? Right, right. Okay. <laughs> okay. I just wonder if you were listening. But okay, I'll get to it. Okay. Let me do it. Um, 
the idea that right now the average CEO still makes a factor of between 350 to 500 more than the average worker, whatever, whatever paper you read, whatever survey you read, it's obscene. The, 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 the maldistribution. That's the A part. So just let's not, let's not spend time whining about that. It's there, it's real, and it's really, I think there may be some correction due to the market. The, the, the big issue is, even economists don't have an answer for your question. There's no salary that, that is, it comes out of economic theory when you have stars and celebrities. There's, there's no rationale for explaining why a, a Grasso got the money he got or a star pitcher for some team gets what, what uh, they get. So frankly, I, I don't know if I can answer other than the fact that and I don't think the laws will do it. I do think that the board structure is changing. I think we now have compensation committees, which are all outside members, auditing committees, which now hire their own lawyers and all that sort of thing. I think the public outcry will work. I think the media will work. But frankly, other than those voices from the public, and so far, you know, they haven't worked that well. Maybe the Oxley Sarbanes bill will help. Maybe the public furor will help. But, and it's also the fact is that we have a hard time correlating performance with, 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 with compensation. In fact, the latest issue of Fast Company deals with six CEOs, all of whom are making, well, one is close to home, Michael Eisner at Disney, making last five years, his salary comes to $789 million. Almost a bit, last five years. That includes bonuses, comes five year period. $789 million. Just in six or seven like that, still in job, and so forth. What worried me most about the article was when they talked about who should replace them, all came from outside the company. So Eisner's going to be replaced by Sherry Lansing, which I think would be a good move, by the way. That's not the point. She's from Paramount. She's from Viacom. What tells me is leaders, those leaders are wrong, not just because of their salaries, which are obscene, because they have not been developing their leadership and their cadre of leaders that could do it. The fact that all cases they were going outside that's what bothered me, even more than the salaries. Although that gives me worries too. I want to thank you very much for your attention. Hey everyone, my name is uh, Benjamin Montañez. I'm the chairman of the Consortium on Global Leadership at the Kennedy School. The uh, Consortium on Global Leadership, CGL, is the only organization at Harvard comprised of students from the Kennedy School, the Law School, and the Business School. Our crest is over here on the, uh, on the wall. We've kind of, uh, we've put them all together though. Uh, this is largely uncharted territory, and we're grateful to the Center for Public Leadership for helping us out, and uh, they've really supported us, and they've really been willing to assist us in this endeavor. For more information on upcoming events or how to get involved, please sign up at our table that we have in the lobby. We also have uh, representatives from the three schools. We've got Carly Kelly and Chris Ray from Harvard Law School. Any law school folks, come and talk to them. They're bosses over there. We've also got uh, Gog Boonswang from the Harvard Business School. And he's the guy you want to talk to over there. This is the consortium's kickoff event of the year, and we're delighted that Professor Bennis was gracious, to accept, gracious enough to accept our invitation. We know that he's much in demand, and so we truly appreciate this opportunity. Uh, after Professor Bennis concludes his remarks, we're going to open it up to a question and answer period. We've set up two microphones in the aisle. Uh, so. In order to ask a question, please make your way to the mics so that the uh, audience members can hear and Professor Bennis can hear your question. Uh, yeah. When posing a question, please, general rules, state your name, your school affiliation, and your year. Uh, Professor Bennis needs no introduction to Harvard or the MIT communities, but in case any members of our audience are new or have been under a rock, we, I'm going to give a brief introduction and then quickly get out of your way. <laughs> Uh, Professor Bennis is a visiting scholar at the Center for Public Leadership. He currently serves as chair of the Center's advisory board and is a Thomas S. Murphy Distinguished fellow, Research Fellow at the Business School. He is visiting from the University of Southern California where he is a distinguished professor of business administration and he's the founding chairman of the USC Leadership Institute. <laughs> See, uh, as, a, as a Yankee fan since I was five, uh, it's very hard, and I've been going to grief counseling this week to uh, <laughs> I'm used to it. I, I'm very glad, so glad to be here because there's anything that, you know, involves the bringing together, crossing boundaries of, of any department and discipline in school. It's not easy. 
and I want to congratulate the, the Consortium for Global Leadership for having the perseverance and the, um, and the, the drive to get this thing started. I think it's really, really important. We don't usually have that opportunity. And Benjamin, thank you and your leadership and the others from the law school uh, and the business school for being this off. It's just, it's really <coughs> great. And I want to celebrate it and congratulate you for this opportunity. I had the pleasure last year of also kicking off the year and I'm, you know, I'm, let's make this an annual event. It'd be great. <laughs> It'd be great. Um, yeah, le leadership, and I'm going to go through my re remarks very br briefly uh, uh, and try to get as much questions, ideas from you all, too. But, you know, when we're dealing in the topic of leadership, it's always, it's regularly contested terrain. You I mean, know, just so many takes. I see before me colleagues who have written terrific books on leadership. We all have our point of view. That's what makes the field, the idea of leadership, so incredibly fascinating, inviting, and endlessly interesting. I mean, it is one of those things one can study all their lives um, and still feel there's so much you don't know. And that's not just false modesty. I've written a lot in the topic, but I still know that there are so many areas there that are still to be discovered. And that's, these days, I think, especially though, people are, we're, we're always interested in leadership, really. But in fact, these days, maybe especially so, the world situation, uh, the globalization, and of course, the looming. In addition to Harvard University and USC, Professor Bennis has been on the faculties of MIT, Boston University, and numerous universities around the world. He's also served as provost of the State University of New York at Buffalo, and president of the University of Cincinnati. Professor Bennis has found the time to write more than two dozen books, including the best-selling Leaders and On Becoming a Leader, both translated into 21 languages. The Financial Times recently named Leaders as one of the top 50 business books of all time, and his book, An Invented Life, was nominated for a Pulitzer. Pulitzer. Uh, his most recent book, which I read last semester and highly recommend, <laughs> is Geeks and Geezers, how Era, Values, and Defining Moments Shape Leaders, co-authored with uh, Robert J. Thomas. Outside of academia, Professor Bennett is a consultant for, more than, for many Fortune 500 companies and has served on four U.S. presidential commissions. The title of today's talk is The Most Common and Fatal fa Failures of Leadership. So without further ado, Professor Warren Bennis. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so pleased that I'm so sorry that we don't have enough places to, to sit for you back there, but certainly uh, I'm just thrilled at the, I, you know, I'm, I'm so thrilled because not only are other invited guests here, but also my, I see a number of my students in my current class, my doctoral seminar, and excitingly, two of my former undergraduate students at the University of Southern California, my day job. By the way, is there anything going on later tonight? <laughs> so I, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, I, <laughs> Whoa, okay. and still to be an unfolding of uh, corporate misbehaviors, malfeasances, crimes, felonies that are still being played out, which make those of us who are mainly concerned as I've been, but not exclusively though, with corporate leadership, it makes one really have to question what we've been doing and to take a serious look at what we're doing. And usually, um, you know, and there you can also see the interest in, in leadership by the just tons of books. And, you know, I just Googled the topic of leadership and came up with about nine million items. You know, and they keep going. That was just, you know, last month. It's going to be more as we go on. And some of the books these days uh, on leadership really do interest me. Uh, Jesus, CEO, Michelangelo, CEO, Queen Elizabeth I, CEO, <laughs> the, the Tao of Leadership. Um, but my, my recent favorite is the Mafia Manager. <laughs> and uh, it, it, there are a lot of things I learned in this book. They end with four big deliverables, they call it. Uh, one, it pays to get information from the enemy. Two, punish one, teach a hundred. 
three, keep your, your friends close, but your enemies keep them closer. And uh, fourth, if you must lie, be brief. <laughs> <laughs> Most of the work on leaders uh, has been in the, uh, it, they tend to be, including work of my own, they tend to actually take outstanding exemplary leaders and try to illustrate through their uh, narratives some ideas of exemplary leadership. Uh, Churchill once said that we're all worms. Some of us are glowworms. And most of the people that I've written about, and some of the authors I see in my audience have written about, tend to be exemplary. And I think, actually, there's a point to this. We think we learn more from outstanding individuals than we do from, in my, in my sense, than we do from run-of-the-mill average. Both extremes. Outstanding, you can learn a lot more, I think. And I've certainly, my emphasis has really been on outstanding, exemplary, uh, really, people whose leadership values and behaviors I tend to identify and even valorize. Well, tonight I'm going to turn my attention elsewhere. Tonight I'm going to talk about what are some of the common failings. Uh, and, I want to, um, and I want to address just a couple of them. But I'm not, mind you, going to be talking about the Ken Lays and the Bernie Ebers, those scoundrels and criminals and crooks who have run away with or cost the American public, cost us, just, in, just since uh, the latter part of 01, something in the neighborhood approaching, approaching $4 billion. I'm not talking about the crooks tonight. I want to talk more about some of the things that we all, all leaders, every once in a while. Um, but some of them can be fatal. And, um, and as I thought about this talk tonight, it's interesting that all three of the failures, the, the most common failures I'm going to dwell on, um, are as aspects of knowing or seriously not knowing. All, you know, it was interesting. I had no idea that would be the, the framework. But it fit in, it, 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 my, my remarks really fit into that very simple framework. Things that we know and don't know. And the first will have to do with, with uh, knowing others. If you want to put it in conceptual ways, knowing the social network. That's one. But knowing others. And the second is some, a phrase that I've really actually borrowed and, and really have taken from some recent work going on with uh, Tony Mayo and Nitin Noria at, at the Harvard Business School, which I want them to call their work, I want them to title their book, they're not decided on that yet, Contextual Intelligence. It's an area that's really not been dealt with very much. And I think their book may make a, a landmark contribution. 